short of seats. So we are bringing in some more chairs. The shiv you cannot see. Welcome to this evening. Yet another session of Gandhi Matters. Organized by the Raza Foundation in collaboration with the India International Center. Before we start the session, a friend of ours, a social scientist of eminence, somebody interested in other arts, Suresh Sharma, expired yesterday. He was a friend of Raza Foundation. He had organized two major events for us. One on word and image and international seminar. And he was keeping unwell for about two years. So sadly, he passed away yesterday. So before we start the proceeding, we'll rise for a minute in silence. Well, the speaker today is Professor Shiv Vishwanathan. I was going to say the other way around. The speaker today is Shiv Vishwanathan, who professes whatever he professes in Hindal Global University. And he is the director of the Center for the Study of Knowledge Systems in the same university. He's a trained social anthropologist who had taught in many universities, including Smith College, Massachusetts, University of London, Delhi School of Economics, and Center for Study of Developing Societies. Most of our thinkers are very somber, serious people. Uh, when they speak, there is an intellectual excitement, but there is no intellectual delight. <laughs> One exception is Shiva Vishwanath. He not only plays with ideas, but also with language. And through that, he brings some very interesting insights and make us feel uncomfortable but not too disturbed. His, there are many books. He has been a, a, interested in the history of science particularly. So organizing for science, carnival for science, that title itself will tell you uh, the kind of thing that he does, a carnival of science. And then the next book, which came out in 2016, Theatres of Democracy. So Shiva Vishwanathan is here to talk to you about reinventing Gandhi. It's particularly poignant or relevant at this moment when just now the assassin of Gandhi has been declared as a true patriot by one of the main uh, I don't know how to use the word fake sadhvis <laughs> because if such people are sadhvis then most real sadhvis must leave India perhaps the universe but anyway so it is particularly that how do we reinvent this is also a reinvention in a manner of speaking uh, that the sadhvi fake sadhvi has done by uh, making both of them equally patriotic. Strangely, Gandhi is looming large in an election which had nothing to do with him. 
in many ways. And in an India which has come far away from Gandhi in most ways. But somehow, and the ruling party found it fit to deny it immediately and to deny it most vociferously, which is of course a technique which is at the first try out. It has a wider spread and then of course deny. So there you are. Let us hear Sri Vishnathan how to reinvent Gandhi. Refused. I thought that was the most boring ritual a Delhi crowd could indulge in. In fact, I think there is something wrong with the way we look at anniversaries. Anniversaries generally give you a sense of renewal. There's a sense of play, there's a sense of memory. But anniversaries of late have become acts of taxidermy. And the 150th anniversary of Gandhi in particular. In fact, in that sense, I must congratulate the Raza Foundation for having a sense of hope that they could have at least found eight speakers to wreck you on Gandhi. But I think deeply and fundamentally, what we have to understand is that we have made Gandhi boring. In fact, I am reminded of a story, the first half of which many of you know, when an American journalist approaches Gandhi and says, what do you think of Western civilization? And he says, it would be a good idea. But I think what is more interesting was the cartoon I saw Ovi Vijayan have, where Gandhi, after a few decades, returns to India, now leaning on a stick, and he is asked, what do you think of Indian civilization? And he says, that would also be a good idea. <laughs> and I think the efforts of the Gandhi, uh, Raza Foundation is partly in trying to create such good ideas. What's worse is the kind of scholarship one sees on Gandhi today. Diligently for once, I tried to create a review of literature. And then I found there are four basic approaches to Gandhi. The first is what I call an annotative approach. It turns Gandhi into a kind of quiz. The best example would be Munnabhai. That is, it gives you every document annotated so completely that you can answer a quiz, a complete miracle of information. But there is no interpretation. The second kind of thing is a complete waterfall of storytelling. Story follows story, but there is no discourse, there is no theory. And I think it's interesting to watch whether it's the annotation, which avoids hermeneutic, or the anecdote which avoids discourse, to a certain extent, Gandhi the theorist disappears. In a neoliberal world, the anecdotal Gandhi is digestible. And I think what we have to ask is, are there other possibilities? Unfortunately, most scholars from the West, for all their hosannas to Gandhi, tend to see him as a derivative Western figure, a minor imitation of an Enlightenment critique. So Gandhi becomes at the most a second-hand Rousseau or Ruskin. But I think there's one group, small but delightfully mischievous and interesting, who tended to see Gandhi as an intellectual, as a scientist. One can see it in the work of Anuradha Shah, you can see it in the work of J.P.S. Oberoi, but I think one can see it most of all in the work of one of the great intellectual pranksters and theorists of our time, Ramu Gandhi. This lecture is a tribute to Gandhi, Ramu and the Mahatma. In fact, if you look at Gandhi, the scientific Gandhi, the cognitive Gandhi, the intellectual Gandhi, Gandhi the theorist, one is reminded of Tolstoy's great appeal when he once asked a question, why can't the Sermon on the Mount have the scientific status of the Pythagorean theorem? Why can't the movement of ethics be a movement of science? And I think when I think of Gandhi, I think his whole work is an attempt to re respond to Tolstoy's question. But there are problems. How do you read Gandhi? How do you read Gandhi the scientist? How do you read Gandhi the experimentalist? Because 
you got to understand i mean I remember my old friend the scientist cv shishadri telling me you guys read gandhi so religiously as if it's a catechism you should read his notes on the ashram as if they're a set of experimental results tentative notes of a man trying to create a new kind of ethics and a new kind of society so you begin almost all gandhi's works begin with an act of pilgrimage a pilgrimage of ideas where you review the literature then it's an act of rereading which is hermeneutics then he creates a heuristic a framework of ideas which he can apply to action he has generally a hypothesis but most interestingly he creates an experiment an experiment which begins with himself and i think this is fascinating because of all the scientists generally you experiment or another but gandhi begins by saying every experiment is an exercise on the self but we can't deal with the old gandhi i think if you want to reinvent gandhi today you have to do three things you have to rewrite hind swaraj you have to revisit champaran and you have to reinvent my experiments with truth and i'll try to do all these things within the next 40 minutes but there's a problem when you read hind swaraj today it sounds naive as one of my friends put it i can see suresh sharma almost frowning at me it sounds like an essay where the man begins by saying the cow has four legs but there's an obviousness to it a naivete which we have to change but i think really what has happened today in the last 100 years what we confront is what i'm going to call imitating hana arendt the banality of goodness goodness has failed i can think of several examples bollywood in fact would be the best example if you see any amitabh movie the good man the good father the good teacher the good cop and the good mother disappear before the interval goodness is not supposed to survive only then can you have the explosive power of evil let me push this a bit further the night that also was in the national movement gandhi realized the national movement was a costume ball of ideas but the indian nation state emerged out of two of the greatest genocides of history partition and the bengal famine and i think we got to be very clear here while nationalism was a celebration of plurality and ideas the nation state was a corset nationalism was naive about the nation state and in fact i remember my old colleague ashish nandi i wish you were here coming to me one day after a faculty meeting and saying don't recommend good people to me good people are boring goodness is boring give me someone with an evil eye ashish always exaggerated but i think to a certain extent what one sense is that his sense of goodness was correctness goodness doesn't depeal it doesn't have a drama it doesn't have a sense of playfulness and i think we're to a certain extent this is what we face today that evil and violence have become delightfully inventive while goodness has become boring and in fact as a friend of mine put it today most people are either good or evil you're caught within that structure of indifference of conformity and the question is how does one look at the most inventive thing today a social scientist friend of mine said forget science the two most inventive things in india today are corruption and violence it's the inventiveness of violence that we have to understand if we have to reinvent gandhi because to a certain extent let us remember that his comments on the concentration camp in his conversations with martin buber and his comments on nuclear energy are incomplete there's almost a naivete about them but i think today what we confront is a structure of collective violence which is so frightening that i want to chronicle it let me begin with four kinds of violence that we confront today i'll do it by triangles 
uh, we got the picture there yeah first genocide I remember Leo Cooper saying why does everyone place the nation state in fact nation states should have genocidal counts and he went on to list that in the 20th century the nation state eliminated 80 million of its own people and I think we've got to begin by looking at a demography of violence which goes beyond the individually ethical we have to look at notions of extinction because extinction today has become rampant in a way we don't understand today one species disappears every fortnight in fact as Ganesh Devi my old friend once said you got to understand that the government of India indulged in an act of linguicide when it defined language as something that possesses script in that moment we destroyed 1800 oral languages the way languages disappear the way species disappear is something that haunts us today in fact I remember a Gandhian friend of mine saying today if you want trusteeship every man has to be one language one craft one species till you own up to these until you internalize these you don't have trusteeship in fact it reminds me of the Ray Bradbury story Fahrenheit 451 which is the temperature at which paper burns it's a place where books are banned and the answer to it is each man becomes a book so Ashok becomes Shakespeare with your approval you become Hamlet and what happens is each one becomes a repository of a certain kind of memory memory is central today and memory haunts us because in a deep and fundamental way what Gandhi says is one of the things you need to begin today with is an ethics of memory I'm coming to that but coming back to violence the third thing we face is apocalypse sudden industrial catastrophes which we don't understand it could be Chernobyl it could be Bhopal if you look at each of these acts of collective violence we almost as I have no story no testament no testimony no analysis of it you might have a court case the second one in fact is more frightening I think for the first time Indian democracy understands what a gulag is I was surprised when the Supreme Court said that it could evict in one stroke two million tribals I was even more surprised when a man like Amit Shah says that externing four million people in Assam is no problem when you create gulags of the mind of this kind you threaten democracy the gulagization of a people is something that we have to confront because it's the banality of violence behind it as Ashok would say all you need is a clerk with two signatures the more undecipherable the better and I think what we face along with gulagization is what I'm going to call I'll just move this way yeah. enclosure my friend Devendra Sharma who's working on agriculture told me something interesting he said one thing neither the Congress nor the BGP faces is the coming death of Indian agriculture it's got nothing to do with biotechnology it's got to do with the fact that today agriculture is no longer seen as a way of life and the amount of people in marginal communities and in agriculture who are losing their livelihoods is amazing it runs to millions yet you'll never see a conversation about it you'll see a conversation about price control you'll see a conversation about migration but the fact that we are facing one of the greatest enclosure movements in history in India is something you'll never get a mention you can go to Delhi School of Economics, you can go to JNU. You'll get every bit of radical crap except an understanding of the depth of agriculture. And the depth of agriculture is something which needs a different kind of storytelling. And the third aspect that I want to describe is displacement. All these are policy violences, but displacement in particular is paradoxical and ironic. Because in a Nehruvian sense, he began by saying, dams are the temples of modern India. But today, dams and other projects of development have displaced almost 60 million people. You've created a set of internal refugees. So if you start adding up the score, 
We are looking at displacement, removal, elimination of millions of people. How does the Satyagri confront that? It's not a face-to-face -face encounter. How does one confront the demographics of collective deaths? But before I do that, I want to come back to one other kind of violence that we never talk about. And the first time I managed to get a hint of it was when I discovered the amount of people who disappear in the IT industry in India. Not marginal communities. The amount of middle class people who are unemployed in the IT industry in India is stunning. I defy any economic man to write even one word about it. And to that obsolescence, you have a something which I don't think most people talk about. Iatrogeny. The man who first talked about it in a different way was Shipkovensky, the Bulgarian poet. But it was further extended in the work of Ivan Ilyich. Ilyich discovered a stunning fact. 45% of illnesses today are doctor induced. That is, it's the expert who is the source of illness. And it's an irony we have to understand. In each of these cases, you talk of innovation. You never talk of obsolescence. You talk of development, but never of displacement. And what we have to understand is that many of these violences are surrounded in a shroud of silence. A kind of invisibility which social science makes sure remains that way. And I want to begin with these acts of violence and eventually I want to come down to the final one. In fact, the first time I was introduced, it was told to me by an astronomer. I asked him once, what do you think is the most violent thing in India? You know, I thought you'd say mob mentality. Is. She said food. The production of food in India is one of the most violent acts you can think of. And she said, come to the market. She lifted up the vegetable. He said, do you know the amount of hormones in one of these drugs? And I didn't believe it till I went down to the market in Haryana, where the guys told me, Saab, tinda chota hai, but paas din dejiye, hum to injection deke usko bada bada. I think what you've got to understand is today, the production of food, the consumption of food, the distribution of food is surrounded by a violence we don't understand. It's got nothing to do with vegan mentality. It's, just, it's got to do with the fact, I mean, just try it. A riddle that one person somebody asked me, though it was asked in a Western context. If a tin of baked beans reaches your breakfast table, how many energy miles do you think it consumes? Any guess? 45,000 miles. We don't con con calculate the kind of violence that goes into the production of food. And the, what Gandhi is going to confront today is this, the unstated violence, the scientific violence of the time, the collective violence. We have got a situation where violence is most in inventive, but you've got to go beyond mob mentalities. You've got to go beyond rape and brutality to look at a different kind of violence. And in this context, you have to understand that violence needs a storyteller. And a storyteller who lives long after the violence is over. Because one of the sadnesses of violence today is that the storyteller disappears halfway. Now, I want to push this a bit further. How does one look at this? Can we rewrite a Hind Swaraj to take into account this? And you've got to understand, Hind Swaraj is a brilliant document. Everyone tends to see it as a primitive document. But I think it matches the Communist Manifesto of the Rights of Man. Provided you see it in the right way. Hind Swaraj was a critique of modernity, which tended to say that modernity was too obsessed with history. And what you needed was a different notion of time, a different idea of nature. I mean, let's take a simple thing. Hind Swaraj has to show that modernity can be written in multiple time. And I was struck by this the first time when I found an anthropologist friend of mine reading the Brundtland report. He said, bad social science, bad literature. 
And then he said that the entire document is written in linear time. And if you think of it, the Brundtland report talks of sustainability in linear time. And the anthropologist turned around and said, my tribals in Buster have 12 different kinds of time. This Anglo-Saxon has one. You can't talk of democracy in unilineal time. Because linear time is genocidal. Linear time is a time of development. But there's no place for the tribal. There's no place for the nomad. There's no place for the defeated. There's no place for history is forgotten. So what you need is a different kind of time. A time would say Raimund Panika coined in his Gifford lectures. He called it chirological time. It's a time where past, present and future are simultaneously present. So your responsibility to the ancestor, your duty to the future is simultaneously in the present. You can't think the future is something 10, 20 years distant. The future is also now. What he says in that context is time then becomes an act of trusteeship, taking it from Gandhi. When time becomes an element of trusteeship, you rewrite Hen Swaraj. Let's take a second example. How do you look at violence of an individual? Let me ask you a question. What's your genocidal count? In terms of consumption? Not just in terms of carbon footprints. What is the genocidal count of this room? Through your acts of consumption, through your sense of what you think is a good life, how many people will you eliminate? I remember the first time an engineer friend of mine told me, go put off that switch. Put it on, he said. Now tell me how many tribals you eliminated. I think we have to look at violence in a different way. And Hind Swaraj has to look at the different kinds of violence created by modernity. But for, to do that, you need a different notion of time. And time has to return nature back into history. In fact, I remember at a JNU conference, I suddenly cheekily told them, the trouble with you historians is you're too anthropocentric. Everyone objected. And then I said, I quoted Lynn Margolis, who once said, historians are so anthropocentric, she was tempted to start a trade union for the role of bacteria in history. Bacteria plays a powerful role in history. We don't chronicle it. A Hind Swaraj which understands the chain of being gives a different understanding of history. Because it gives a different understanding of nature. And I think one has to begin with this. A scenario where you're talking about a different kind of violence and a need for a different understanding of evil. Gandhi knew he was naive about certain things. He was naive about the nuclear bomb. He was naive about the concentration camp. Where would the Satyagrahi survive in the concentration camp? I've been researching it for some time. Because ask yourself, who are the three greatest people who survived the concentration camp? The answer is quite interesting. Major communist ideologists, they survived the camp with dignity. But next to them, all the major fundamentalists survived the camp with dignity. Between ideology and fundamentalism, sometimes there's not much to choose. And the third group that survived it was strangely the theosophists. Each of them had a dream of the future in a different way. And because they had that sense, that belief in the future, they survived. They survived with dignity. They survived in an everyday sense. The question Gandhi asked us to ask is, can the Satyagrahi match that? But let me push it further. The Satyagrahi today, if you look at Satyagraha, you almost see it as a sign of weakness. Next to the RSS Shaka, it's a feature of contempt. The Satyagrahi is opposed to the guerrilla, who during the ages of the Vietnam War was a great legendary hero. In fact, the guerrilla proved in a fundamental way, that the American soldier was just a high calorie consumer. In fact, I still remember the scenes at the end of 1954, 
when the French had been defeated at Dien Bien Phu. And Michael Elliot Bateman, one of the great historians, talks about that movement. He said the French came and with great music left. There was a silence. Nothing happened for 20 minutes. And suddenly you saw a man in a solar topi, in a bicycle, holding a grenade, driving a bicycle. You saw the guerrilla. But the guerrilla today has de deteriorated from the kind of symbolic technological significance he had in the Vietnam War, he has today become a terrorist. When the Satyagraha confronts the terrorist, what happens today? How do you invent a Satyagraha which can confront terror? In a way you have to look at the kind of work of Oboroi and others who have pointed out that for all the fact of terrorism, terrorism has no notion of life-givingness. While a martyr, even in the moment of death, is an affirmation of life. In fact, there's a beautiful essay on Jean Palach, the Ch a Czech dissenter, where to a certain extent you understand the power of martyrdom as the power of life-givingness. And I think to a certain extent we have to understand this to understand what the Satyagraha today is about. It's a different kind of cosmology. I think the greatest Gandhians are not Indians anymore. You have to go to a Vakla Havel or a Lanza Vasto. But to me, one of the greatest Gandhian experiments ever conducted was the Truth Commission. I went to South Africa 17 times to look at the Truth Commission. And watching Tutu was magnificent. The guy looks like a village idiot. He behaves like one too. And in fact, we look at the English language versions of the Truth Commission. They're all critical of Tutu. But people forget that Truth Commission was conducted in seven other languages. And the narratives in Zulu and others, you get a totally different picture. Because the English one saw the Truth Commission through the perspectives of Anglo-Saxon law. So even some of the greatest critics, Julia Kristeva, saying, confession, confessions are only meant for the privacy of the church. They can't be a public document. Jacques Derrida, Truth Commission. Tutu doesn't understand law. He's confusing amnesty with forgiveness. But Tutu was speaking a different language. He was speaking the language of the tribe. Where Ubuntu signified a different kind of forgiveness. Where the language of forgiveness was different, was cosmological. Satyagra has to return back to the cosmologies of language. And I think that's what we saw powerfully. You know, when you see a Truth Commission in action, it's stunning. At first sight, it's like a B-grade Bollywood movie. The way people forgive each other. But then when you see the encounter, it's stunning. I saw an encounter where the head of intelligence washes the feet of the victim he had betrayed and tortured. The scene is stunning. Even a skeptic like me is kind of reduced to tears. Till I discovered something. Every journalist who covered the Truth Commission had a psychological breakdown. The narratives are stunning. They're almost impossible to understand. How do you create a Satyagrahi which can today understand the Truth Commission? Can we create a Truth Commission for Kashmir? Or for the Northeast? Can we create a Truth Commission even for the partition? Because the poignancy of the partition is something we haven't understood. It's a failure of storytelling. In fact, I'm reminded of two stories from Ashish Nandi's hopefully forthcoming book. He's been writing it for so long, but it's a brilliant classic. The first story deals with the fact to tribe, a group, a family of Sikhs. A few villages off in Lahore. Se Seventy of them. And they suddenly realize they're surrounded by Muslims. And the Sikh pat paterfamilias, the grandfather says, no, if you go outside, all you women will be raped. I'll kill you each singly. His sister comes, gives him a glass of milk before he begins the ritual. And in half an hour, he has eliminated 60 members of the family. 
except the child. The grandson goes and says, I'll come out with you and fight the case. So grandfather and grandson step out. The mob is about to lynch them. And suddenly an old man in the back says, this was the family who helped us in crisis. The crowd lets the man go. But he can't live with the prospect that he has murdered 60 of his own family. The grandson commits suicide. How do you capture the poignancy of a story like this? And then we had another story which Chandrika Pama investigated in her case. We met a man who was, in fact, went to interview him on effluent plants. He discovered we were interested in partition and he started weeping. Then I asked him, what happened? He said, I was there. And he told us the full idea of the train to Amritsar. After seven interviews, he discovered he was exactly two years old when the partition happened. But he had internalized his grandfather's memory. Esat's memory is a stunning fact. And you've got to understand that many of the RSS today live on Esat's memory. <coughs> because the old survivors of the partition never speak this language. We have to look at memory in a different way. And one of the first things the new idea of Hinswaraj would do is to revive the idea of memory. Gandhi would in fact propose a new social contract between the oral, the textual and the digital. You cannot write an Indian constitution till it has the power of orality. Because the power of orality is the power of storytelling. Imagine a constitution which can't be told as a story. Not in the boring law classes. Lawyers are terrible storytellers, I can vouch for it. But the question is, how do you capture this? In fact, Hint Swaraj begins with an idea that you need to revive memory. And Gandhi's idea of technology then becomes a conversation between the ethics of memory and the ethics of invention. And remember, memory is inventive. I remember during the Industrial Commission, one of the Englishmen, a great Englishman, Alfred Chatterton, objects. He said, the, English, the Indians have by-hearted us. By-heart is an Indian word. True. We by-hearted the English Constitution, we by-hearted Shakespeare, we by-hearted the Bill of Rights. In a way, the English never understood. Orality. And the power of orality and what it does to memory becomes central. Because one of the things I noticed today is... That with the rise of the information society, what you have is a decline of memory. A decline of the politics of memory. And Hinswaraj becomes a new testament and a testimony to the power of memory in modern society. Because it's only then can you understand the structure of violence we're dealing with. It's only then can you understand the power of witness. And the sophistication of storytelling. I want to push this a bit further. One of the things that one tends to see is the fact that today we don't look at the question of vulnerability. And a Gandhian idea of violence needs a new reading of vulnerability. A new reading of vulnerability around the body. Because you can't have one last man. You need a spectrum of last men. The last tribal, the last Dalit, the last farmer. Because it's only then can you have the versatility, the multiplicity, the plurality of storytelling that you can bring back together. Vulnerability allows for a theory of alternatives. Vulnerability allows for storytelling. In fact, I remember Viswada Wilson telling me once, he was of course talking about the septic tank and in his drawling South Indian accident, he said, that's all very well. You can have all the Swachh Andolans you want. But the end of every Swachh Andolan is a skeptic tank and next to it is a skeptic me. The question is, he didn't stop there. He said, this kind of vulnerability, this kind of idea of the scavenger needs a new notion of the city. So Gandhi in Hinswaraj begins with a new idea of the Dalit theory of the city. So I asked Bethwara, what does that mean? He said a western city is constructed visually 
in terms of a linear perspective, a Dalit theory obtains a sense of justice from a sense of smell. Your city, he said, is deodorized. My city stinks. And justice begins when you remove that stink or you share it. This idea of vulnerability then becomes central to a critical violence today. How do we create this kind of vulnerability? How do you speak the language of vulnerability? How do you create agency back to vulnerability? Because vulnerability is also the moment out of which we create the new alternative imaginations. The vulnerability of agriculture, the vulnerability of nomadism, the vulnerability of the tribal, the vulnerability of the dissenting imaginations. It is out of that that we have to create the new democracy. So citizenship becomes not the first man, but the spectrum of the last men who may not survive even the good intentions of democracy. But I want to emphasize something. There was nothing naive about Gandhi. I asked a scientist friend of mine to read me Gandhi's idea of technology, C.V. Seshadri. And he read me, saying, he said, you've got to begin by understanding that today Satyagar needs to go back to the ashram because the ashram invented the possibilities of a non-violent imagination. He said, have you read Gandhi's notes on, t on the ashram? He begins with three models of technology, prayer, walking, food. And if you read his notes, he has a tremendous sense of technology. To Sishadri, who first pointed out to me that it was in a Gandhian rally that the microphone was first introduced in India. William Shire backs it up in data. <coughs> in fact, I must go back to my favorite story about how uh, Jamanar Bajaj gave Gandhi a car, a Ford in the ashram. It breaks down after two weeks and is pulled by a bunch of cattle and Gandhi would refer to them as saying, see my Oxford. <laughs> I think that sense of hybridity, that sense of fun also captures his sense of what to look at technology. For all his saintliness, for all his martyrdom, he was a bunya. I remember him going to Manchester, inspecting the uh, workers who had been unemployed by the boycotts in India. And his first speech was, no wonder the Japanese are beating you. He had a sense of competition. He had a sense of cost benefit. And if we look at his new idea of technology, the technology is nothing ludite about it. Seishatri worked it out for me. He said, this is a bunya and a saint in conversation. And if you look at it, what is the Gandhian theory of technology really? Accounting, paisa vasool. Accountability, responsibility for the kind of technology you produce. Third, resp responsibility itself of technology to the community because technology reinvents the community. He says most theories of technology would stop here. Gandhi added two more, trusteeship and sacrifice. And I, you know, for a long time I didn't understand what was the tandem between Kumaraswamy and Gandhi. Gandhi also felt, uh, in fact, it's fascinating. One of the greatest papers the Indian National Movement had was a critique of the museum. I'm sorry if they're museum lovers here. And Anand Kumaraswamy says that the one thing the Indian National Movement must do is to fight a guerrilla war against the museum. If God were to return today and ask civilized Western man where the Aztecs and Incas were or where the Australian Aborigines in disappeared, would he take him to a museum? The museum smells of death and formaldehyde, which is Gandhi's statement also about the nature of technology. How do you create life-giving technologies? And I think that's where his idea of Swadeshi and Swaraj is just brilliant. When the dewdrop can resonate the ocean, when the locality as neighborhood can resonate the power of a planetary cosmos, you have a different idea of scale. Gandhi was not about intermediate technology or organic technology or any such thing. Gandhi had visions of scale of an enormous order. And you know, Seshadri explained it to him. The problem is Gandhi didn't have the terminology for it. 
Gandhi was not for just decentralization. He said Gandhi was panarchic. I said, what the hell does that mean? He said, most technology, most organizations are hierarchical. But today, if you look at ecology, you have the idea of panarchy. That is, different levels of the hierarchy operate at different logics of culture. That is, what the panchayat does, the president can't do. And both needs to recognize the limits and possibilities of that. Democracy today has to be panarchic. That is, at every stage you need a different invention, a different choice, a different solution, a different story. For the technologists, Gandhi was stunningly brilliant. It's only the social scientists who remain skeptical of him. And I think that's a paradox and irony that we have to see. Uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. How does one look at the Satyagrahi? And I take two examples from science to make my argument. If Gandhi today had to start the salt march, where would he begin? And I was talking to an astronomer friend of mine who gave me a brilliant solution. She said, first you got to understand something. You social scientists and you patriots get worried about the word secession. In fact, the great historian of science, Dharampal, wrote a brilliant essay on secession. But he said, the first right of an Indian citizenship is to secede. Secession is in our mentalities. I remember as a schoolboy, every time I moved from Bihar to, got past Hyderabad, I used to secede from India. Secession is an act of mentality. But then he says, if you look at the records, all the villagers were allowed to secede from a village. If they didn't like the king, they could abandon the king. And then the scientists went on to say, one of the great challenges of Indian democracy today, especially after the AIDS controversy, is can we secede from the intellectual property system? I thought it was a brilliant idea. Ethically charged. Because to a certain extent, what he actually was arguing is, anyone who patents the seed doesn't understand life. In fact, I remember a statement by Ivan Dirich, when you first heard Bernard Craig, uh, Watson and Crick say, they have found the secret of life. Elish responds, yes, they seem to have found the secret of obscenity, not life. But to a certain extent, life is much, uh, much more emergent. It's not something just encoded in a gene, which provides information, but not the evolutionary perspectives of emergence one needs, even scientifically. The second example, which I found last week in the newspaper, was brilliant, where a group of eight, eight Australian Aborigines decide to file a charge against the Australian government for not meeting the climate change requirements. Imagine today, I think tomorrow we are having our RTI meeting on the right to information. What if all of us get together and file an RTI on climate change? with a government which is so surprisingly illiterate and dishonest about it. Climate change is going to destroy our coastline. In fact, that's the third thing I'd do. I'd forget craft. I'd start a satyagraha on the coastline. I've been spending a lot of time watching the coast. I was there investigating the satellite case when I discovered for the first time that the word Adani is in, has equivalence in Tamil. And Adani is an appropriator of the coastline. And I think what we have to understand is, and then this priest told me, you guys in Delhi don't understand the coastline. We, you think from land to sea, we think from sea to land. Our universe, our cosmology, our democracy is different. How do you create a new island mentality which thinks of the coastline in a different way? I think these are the kinds of satyagraha we need. But to do that, you have to go back to the experiment in the body. Because I think one of the great tragedies we face today is the destruction of the body. The destruction of the body through genocide, the destruction of the body through trafficking, the destruction of the body through industrial exploitation. How do we reinvent the body? And that's where the Gandhian experiment begins. You go back 
to the fundamentals of the body. Rework an idea of science, of self-reliance, of consumption. And in reviving the body, you revive the body politics. So I'll do one last exercise. It owes much to a common friend of ours, Ramu Gandhi. He said, if you want to systematize Gandhi today, so I want to create what I call Ramu's Abacus. He said, let's take this Abacus. On one side, there's you. Because the self is never abandoned in a Gandhian experiment. On the other side, you have all these things. What do you add to each of these elements to make India a democracy? Let's start with the syllabus. And one of the most interesting answers I got was years ago from Amulya Reddy. He said, we need a university which is a scavenger for alternative knowledges. Mainstream knowledge can't solve the problem of waste. And as C.B. Society once said, waste is the only resource of a wasted people. How do you bring back the scavenger, not as a creature of contempt, but as one of the great heroes of modern knowledge? Yes, we should call a commons. Commons is trusteeship. The other day I was looking at the book on the coconut palm, a botany book. A Western one. It, 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 it insists that the coconut palm has exactly one use palm oil. And then I go to Kerala and I discover that in local folklore, a coconut has 132 uses. How do you sustain a tradition of diversity? How do you make the con a constant village part? What does citizenship mean? I think citizenship is an act of invention. And I think one of the most beautiful ideas that I got was from C.V. Sishadri. We said, for him almost deluse. He said a constitution can be for puppets or can be for dancers. Our constitution is for puppets. How do we turn it into a citizenship of dancers? That is, how do we make freedom available? And one of the things really we have to do is to take chakka as a choreography of the technological imagination and turn it into a different kind of citizenship. Where every science, and in fact I was put brilliantly by Mao, but I'll appropriate it for Gandhi. <laughs> every man a scientist, every village a science academy. You create a different kind of citizenship, you create a different idea of knowledge. And you create a different idea of cognitive justice, which is the mediation between different forms of knowledge. Constitution. I think we should get nature back into the Constitution. Our Constitution is a Judeo-Christian. You know, the RSS government doesn't know anything about the Constitution. They think that the Ganges is a person that solved the problem of nature. I think it's the Maoris who understand nature. And I think to a certain extent, if you realize what they did, it was fantastic. A river becomes a person. When you give nature rights, you change the notion of that. Because rights are no longer individualistic. You recreate a notion of the commons. And I think this is really what we need. Unless we create these new possibilities around cosmology, around citizenship, around commons, it won't work. And what we need is the wild ethics of Gandhi. I'll end in a managerial note. Because nowadays everything seems to think they are managerial solutions to problems. And managers, when they can't solve a problem, call it a wicked problem. Wicked problems are complex problems, which defy solution. The solution to a wicked problem is wild ethics. An ethics which transcends table manners and etiquette and goes to surprise you in a new and stunning way. Gandhi created that wild ethics. And the wild ethics of Gandhi is, I think, the ethics of the future. I've kind of given you my idea of Gandhi. Someone who read it told me, this is the Jugaad Gandhi. <laughs> Hurriedly assembled, furiously thought out. True. But if each of us then creates a Jugaad Gandhi and unleashes it on the public today, we'd have the kind of inventions, 
the kind of imaginations, the kind of dreams of a democracy which has stopped dreaming. We only dream of vote and consumption. A democracy which has stopped dreaming needs a Gandhi. It's time for invention. And it's time we reinvent democracy once more. I'll stop here. Well, friends, after this brilliant, slightly puzzling, enormously confusing, <laughs> but very, very exciting presentation, it's time, we have 15 minutes for question answers. Uh, the question should be brief. There should be questions, not opinions. So go ahead. That's difficult on Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> Let always the first. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Well, you wait for the mic. Yes. Yeah, I am Samir. I write for some, uh, you know, international affairs. Uh, I have listened to you in a very uh, apt attention, and uh, you are talking you in a term. You are talking in a term of, uh, you know, elaborating the different notions. Uh, but in scientifically, we have found that the countries which are doing scientifically and they are putting a lot of labor amongst the students, those countries are on the rise. So what Gandhian is saying that you have to get to the technology side by Chakhan, what he means, and then you can, but the dedication and the citizenship is not that important. The dedication of a, each student is important. We can fix the government, uh, that will uh, run on its own. But how far your people are studying is important, and that to a science subject, because you have a lot of nations which are progressing in that nature. Let me take your head on, and let me give you scientists replying back to your question. Starting with the director of Raman Institute. I asked him, why don't you ever recruit IIT people as researchers? He said, are you nuts? All of them are people who have converging answers. I need diverging answers for my researchers. Given the tutorial system, given the IIT system, no IIT guy is ever going to be a good researcher. I think what we are looking at is not a critique of science, but a critique of innovative possibility of science. Let me finish. I come from a family of scientists, so I can give you story after story to match you. And I spent six months a year at the Raman Institute and at NIAS. I think this stereotypical notion of science that you have, that if you actually create education and you create a bit of research, you're going to get a generation of scientists, you're not going to do it. I am talking of converging, converging no. sciences, not science. No, no, you can even talk about your converging sciences. Your notion of science, can I be a bit ungandian, is naive. If you look at the kind of scientific structures we have built, the dissenting imaginations of science don't exist. Where do you find a Saha today who would go to parliament to challenge Nehru? Where would you find a Raman who turn around and tell Indira Gandhi, oh, you're the daughter of the man of the red rose? My research has no time for you. What I'm trying to say is, to a certain extent, our science has become conventional. And the scientists are recognizing this fact. We have a regime which doesn't understand the difference between technology and science. Forget ancient science. So we think all the money should go into rocket science, which is destroying the creativity of all the small sciences. Look at the work of the Indian Science Academy as a critique of this. So what I'm trying to say is, you're talking, I agree with you. Okay, then why destroy the university? The first question I would ask any person today. You love science, why do you destroy the university? I think what we are rightly facing is a regime which doesn't understand science and technology. Which thinks just because it's invited to Davos, it has an understanding. Gandhi understood science and technology. Our beloved Prime Minister is illiterate. And I don't mean science, sorry. You don't mean science. Radar technology is an expert. Oh, of course. He's also an expert on plastic surgery and a few other things. So the question is, oh, he also thinks he understands 
cloud behavior. <laughs> it sounded like cloud behavior, but I was <laughs> So I think that's the candid. I think our national movement had a tremendous understanding of science and technology, which our current regimes don't. And they had an understanding of the ethics of science and technology. You have seen the Indian Science Academy ethics document? It's an absolute piece of garbage. When are you scientists going to confront the question of ethics? Whether it's a nuclear energy or a biotechnology? When the peasant movement challenges your biotechnology groups, what did Jairam Ramesh find out? He got five academies to write the report. And you scientists had copied from a company document? How many facts do you want? Let's take each technology step by step. The illiteracy of science in understanding science is phenomenal today. This is not the topic. But if you want to debate it, I've spent years studying science and technology. I did not. No, I think it's time we break stereotypes. And I think it's time we look at science in a different way. It's happening. Dissenting Indian scientists have done it. Why not honor that dissent and look at science beyond the current frameworks? They make sense of Gandhi. How come you don't? The lady here. Sorry, yes. I think. Uh, oh, <coughs> yeah, right. Anuradha. We've spent most of our. Uh, uh, please, please speak, the speak into the mic. We've spent most of our time post independence uh, asking oh. for a centralized and. That's what you Yeah, a centralized and uh, standardized education. Uh, and I think uh, being in the university, I can tell that. Uh, we were directly responsible because we feel uh, that otherwise standards are not maintained. So the UGC exam is like uh, one of the greatest examples of that and a complete disaster. You know, it's always, um, you know, the best students uh, don't get get through that exam. It's inversely proportional. So why is it that, it, no, I mean, so uh, I think that it is the intellectuals more than the uh, uh, you know, the politicians or the scientists who are. Hey, uh, one of the few times she's agreeing with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, you know, I feel there's a collective responsibility which, uh, I mean, it has a. Uh, I don't know, I would think that that's where one would start in Satyagraha. Yes. I, yeah. I think you're much more forceful in your book when you try to argue with Gandhi as an intellectual as a scientist. I already cited that. So I won't respond to the rest of the questions. Yes. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. I will come to you. Who would be the one? Someone in the back. I can't hear. Suresh and Sharma are here. I am from Madras. I am. Or, which Bharatiya Gandhi ji's बारे में जो आप योग अभी चल रहे हैं, उस बारे में आपका मैं मार्गदर्शन चाहता था. ये तो ठीक है डेढ़ सौ साल हो जाएंगे हो रहे हैं उनको याद किया जा रहा है लेकिन इसके साथ साथ एक घटना और घट रही है कि उनके जन्मोत्सव के साथ साथ कर्मोत्सव की शताब्दी भी हो रही है उस सिलसिले में दो घटनाएं मथुरा की हैं जो कि इतिहास से गायब थी एक तो ये कि गांधी जी का वस्त्रों का त्याग कहाँ पर हुआ वो घटना मथुरा की है और वो लगभग गायब हो चुकी थी वहाँ के जनमानस में और दूसरी है उनकी पहली गिरफ्तारी रौलट विरोधी जो कानून जो रौलट विरोध पे जो उन्होंने सत्याग्रह चलाया था उसके उसके सिलसिले में नौ अप्रैल उन्नीस को और ये बात वहाँ के जनमानस के मानस पटल से उतर गई थी कि उनके आह्वान पर पंद्रह हजार लोग नंगे पैर नंगे सिर और भोखे पे काले झंडों के साथ मथुरा की सड़कों पर उतरे थे उसके बाद जब उनकी ट्रेन वहाँ से गुजरी जब वो अमृतसर के जा रहे थे तो पाँच हजार लोग उनकी भीड़ वहाँ स्टेशन पर इकट्ठा हुई थी फिर जब उनको गिरफ्तार किया गया पहली गिरफ्तारी और मथुरा में उनको लाया गया था वहाँ पे नौ अगस्त को तो फिर बीबीसी नॉर्दर्न एक्सप्रेस से उनको भेजा तो ये सारा इतिहास जो ये गायब हो रहा है ये भी रे इन्वेंशन की हमें एक डिमांड रखता है और हम चाहते हैं कि ये बातें तो होती रहेंगी लेक्चर्स होते रहेंगे जो ये प्रोजेक्ट चल रहे हैं जो हम लिख रहे हैं सरकार को कि भाई वहाँ पर एक मेमोरियल म्यूजियम हो वहाँ इस ट्रेन भारत में पहली गिरफ्तारी है महात्मा गांधी के मेमोरियल एक म्यूजियम बनाया जा सकता है जिसको ताकि आने वाली जनरेशन भी उसको याद करती रहे और ऐसे वस्त्रों का त्याग है ये भी एक ऐतिहासिक घटना है और ये भी रेनवेंशन से जुड़ी हुई बात है कि महात्मा गांधी जो ब्रज में गांधी जब 
प्रज में गांधी बने महात्मा इस तरीके का एक थ्योरी लेकर के हम चल रहे हैं कि उनको महात्मा तो बहुत पहले से कहा गया लेकिन उनका वस्त्रों का जो त्याग है जिसका जिस तस्वीर से आज हम परिचित हैं उसकी शुरुआत मथुरा से होती है इस सिलसिले में हम आपका मार्गदर्शन चाहते हैं I think the Gandhi I watched is not a memorial. It doesn't belong to a museum. He's someone who must be reinvented every day in a different way. It's the inventive Gandhi I watched, not the memorial Gandhi. You can always build a museum for him. It gives you a sense of the sacrosanct. But to me, a Gandhi which allows you for more and more inventions, more and more ethics, more and more experimentation, makes democracy much more interesting. This is the Gandhi you can't museumize, and you can't put in mothballs like the current regime is trying. That Gandhi is lethal, because that Gandhi is also vulnerable and open to debate and discussion. I think it's this Gandhi that we need to talk about. It might be my personal preference, but I think we have to articulate this Gandhi. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Anisha. I had a question going back right where we started about the four ways in which we've re read Gandhi. I think you've covered two, which is the annotative and the storytelling. I'm presuming the third is a more theoretical. I'd be interested to know the fourth. Oh. But, but just a small addition to this, what I am seeing is that there are particular ways to read Gandhi in what you described today in Akhil Bilgrami's work that sort of require an engagement with the storytelling, that require an engagement with his life and his work. So how do we read Gandhi? Yeah. The, the problem with Bill Grammy, for all his brilliance, Gandhi is the derivative of Western thought. Would it be difficult for Akhil to allow for some originality? So what I'm saying, while we have that kind of engagement, hmm. which is there in Akhil, I think Anuradha's book brings it out well. Why not look at the more creative origin of Gandhi? Does he always have to be secondary to Thoreau and Ruskin? Or do you think here is a guy who took on the enlightenment dualisms in a way which was fascinating? Not just as a theory of knowledge, but in terms of the structures of violence. So what I'm trying to say is, you have an annotative Gandhi, which is like a Kunji Gandhi. You have an anecdotal Gandhi. You have a derivative Gandhi. But I think slowly, in the many of the works you have, is a cognitive Gandhi, which is politically powerful and original. Can we bring this back into action? My friend there, sorry, we may need to wait for some Wait, wait for the mic. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was struck by your invitation of the current government, so I'll ask perhaps a, a, a controversial question. Um, uh, our current Prime Minister seems to do a lot of experiments. You have referred to, you referred to, you know, his thoughts about uh, radar and, and, and some. I'm not making a joke. And uh, these appear to be deeply, at least in the telling of it, uh, deeply uh, scientific thoughts, scientific activities. What would happen if there were clouds and we sent planes? He does other things. He talks about a long tapasya, and and there are many aspects of him which are actually quite deeply scientific. They, they, uh, my question is, how do you think Gandhi would have seen this aspect of our current Prime Minister? Gandhi had a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Two, I think he had an idea of science and the scientific experiment. A man who reduces spirituality to techniques of yoga doesn't understand cosmology. A man who thinks Science is expressed in terms of technological experiments, doesn't understand the culture of science. So, while he attempts to create a facade of scientism, I defy you to make one single statement from the Indian Science Congress speeches to his policy documents, which is experimental, scientific, and can withstand scrutiny. Try. I thought you were psychoanalyst for a moment in the way you presented the things. But maybe, yes, our side, our Prime Minister could do with a bit of therapy from science. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, you've taken the example, so let's look at it head on. Okay. Where is the science? Sorry, and I'm, if we give this an open question, so, and this is a question the RSS has asked me many times. And I told him, 
the day you give me a theory of science and give me a theory of the nation, I'll start looking at you. Give me one example. Okay, let's go deeper on the on, on the incident that I referred to. He thought that as an experiment, if I send the planes in while there's cloud cover, my planes would be likely to be successful. <laughs> First, this is it was an afterthought. He doesn't send the it, it wasn't an act of anticipation. So if you're thinking that he carried out a scientific experiment in terms of extrapolation, in terms of alternative possibilities, in terms of testing out these things, I don't think so. And by the way, you can't just pick up a nugget and say you found a gold mine. You have to theorize in a more hard-hearted way. I spent 10 years investigating, oh yeah, there's something scientific about him. The Gujarat riots. I spent 10 years investigating it before I got thrown out of Gujarat. Yes, there's a science there. And it's a science of propaganda. If you see the PM is a master of propaganda. And the master of the erasure of memory. Then you can quote me. You're right. Yes. But if you think he has evidence, Can we move on? Can you give me an example? I've spent years investigating the guy. Try it. It's got nothing to do with right and left. Let's take the facts. The science that you're talking about. Yeah, where is the science? Except, and I think he understood propaganda well. He was, his real science is, he understood that if violence is repeated again and again, it acquires a certain validity. You don't think Gaumutra... Uh, oh, Gaumutra. Yeah, that's not his. If you take out your mother's recipe, you don't acquire the... You see, I think it's something that John Simon once said. He said, the scientist knows less about science than a fish about hydrodynamics. The, he doesn't master the epistemology and the cosmology. So if you throw me a word, it doesn't become a language. It doesn't become an articulation of competence. So you give me a few examples, let's discuss it. I've spent years studying this man. Where is the science? Yes, there is. Sorry, it might be a personal opinion, but I'm ready to back it up with years of research, studying all his speeches. Yeah. The guy is illiterate. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm so so interesting on that. No, no, please, let's just not see a dialogue now. Yeah. I just have out there. Yeah. Back to your lecture. Thanks so much for this investigating you know, uh, series of thoughts given to us to, to, to read my account. I like to place today's lecture in the context of uh, your lecture some months ago in the same institution on Chambari. Okay. And, and there you said, you remember well, Gandhi doesn't have the aesthetics of Tagore. I remember I asked that question to you all mm -hmm. the time. Tagore is aesthetically more provocative. But as you said, Gandhi is, is not so. How would like to get the comment in the context of today's lecture? Let's go back to the debate. What Tagore warned Gandhi about was that a mechanical affirmation of Khadi would lead to a certain kind of aesthetic dullness. And the challenge he gave is how does the aesthetic remain aesthetic? Because Khadi, when it began, was not such an aesthetic exercise. It was just a bit different from Khaki. The battle was between Khadi and Khaki during World War I. And remember how the British described Khaki? Khaki is the leftover of all the dullness that you can find in all colors. Khaki, Khadi was not far behind. The aesthetic came later. And the Tagore Gandhi debates have to be also anchored within the Tagore the Gandhi Kumaraswamy ideas. Where Kumaraswamy presented a critique of PC Ray's idea of synthetic chemistry. Where he said, English is a, not a language that understands color. The redness of red in an Indian village is not the redness of English red. There's a diversity, there's a nuance which goes beyond the wildest dreams of English. I think one has to look at the whole debate. But if you look at it, essays and national ideas, Kumar Swami's article on the gramophone, the synthetic rate, Tagore's article on the, you have a series of debates. 
which I don't see today. Um, is there a sense of the gray zone, Premu Levy's conception of the gray zone in Gandhian thought, or, or the developments of Gandhian thought in your uh, view? Uh, I'm thinking of this especially with respect to your reference to the banality of goodness, uh, because perhaps there's a clue there with respect to this kind of sense of a kind of gray zone, which allows for this kind of uh, uh, sort of pervasive sense of irresponsibility, indifference to take home. But I think Satyagraha was a response to the gray zones of the mind. Because in becoming ethically inventive, you challenge the gray zones of indifference. And to a certain extent, this critique of the profession was an attempt to look at the gray zones of indifference. If I may push you on the science question. Just a minute. Uh, I can wait. I can wait. No, I think I'm disappointed in Shiv's answer on the science question that uh, uh, the gentleman asked about uh, about uh, Modi, uh, because I think what we are dealing with is, uh, I mean, Shiv comes out as saying that uh, it's a uh, science of creativity and uh, diversity, which appreciates diversity. But I think uh, you also made the argument that evil is diverse. And what? We, evil can be creative. Sure. So what we really want is to know what are the principles of the science of violence as against the science of non-violence. Yeah, I think we want to be careful here. His question doesn't enter that zone as yet. So let me be clear. Because to a certain extent, the minute you talk about a non-violent science, you're moving to a different epistemology and a different cosmology. These, yeah, two, but we are, wait, I think the these two words don't enter into Modi's vocabulary. So, I, I'm not going to give him the, ple the privilege of sounding epistemological <laughs> or ethical. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I no. Doing a Anuradha, wait. I think the part of your argument is you're pushing your book onto Modi. <laughs> no, let me, no, no, let me push it further for you. Because to a certain extent, what you're saying is your Gandhian theory would be complete if you give me a theory of a non violent science. I can do that. But it's got nothing to do with Modi. Modi would be, in fact, a bad example of any kind of science. No, I'm just asking you, how would Vikram Sarabhai be any different? No, 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 no. He would be following the foundations of violence. No. I don't understand. No, because that. I think you're being unfair to Vikram. I spent my time investigating this at the... One of the people who objected to nuclear energy for years was Vikram Sarabhai. Please look at the records very carefully. Look at the epistemology of his science. That is what I am saying. No, because I think there are contradictions within there that you have to examine. That to a certain extent, here was also Vikram was Raman's student. And I think to a certain extent you got to understand the contradictions of the man. Vikram was much more complex. And I was stunned when I found out that for years he took a stand against nuclear energy which was brilliant. Even against Homi Baba. So let's give the guy his due. Then criticize him. Last. Finally. <laughs> so uh, the question I have is, it's about, it's about innovation and uh, sort of economy. And I briefly preface it by saying that the military industrial complex and the ones work perfectly well for the United States. I mean, it's a war economy. You can see from back in the 1940s. Second World War was a boom for US. And now, what we have, and what we are being pushed towards, is a consumer economy. So these are two different models of success and growth with proper goals, because growth can be defined and development can be defined in the IAW. So two things. How do you reconcile Gandhian thought with that military industrial complex style of innovation and development and how do you reconcile Gandhian thought with this consumption driven consumer economy and that model of growth and development? Yeah. First I would separate it. Today the consumer industrial complex and the military industrial complex are quite happily hand in hand. And if you now look at many of the kind of investments in science, defense gets priority. I think what Gandhi was trying to say is, war is not the only source of innovation. 
Because you look at the work of everyone in World War II, from Desmond Bernal to Neff, they said, war is the source of innovation. What Gandhi says is, democracy and ethical invention can lead to a different kind of science. In fact, that's the beginning of your non-violent science. And I think that one thing has to be clear. Is there any successful no. example? No, I can give you an example. There have been dissenting scientists in India who worked it out. If you want to really look at the work, look at the work of C.V. Sishatri. MIT, Bhagavad Gandhi, Gimelan, all the mess you would like. Dean of IIT Kanpur goes out to create a laboratory in the slum where he tries to articulate the assumptions of a non-violent science. Starting with the critique of thermodynamics. These things exist. We don't talk about it. We leave it at the externalities of consumption and war. And I think that's where another question becomes more relevant. Can you transcend these and now create the epistemics of a non-violent science? I think a lot of people are working on it. If you give me an email, I can send you a lot of the sources. Whether it's on the nature of food, or it's a question of evolution, or it's a question of even looking at the future. Or even just how you look at time in sciences and in democracy. The epistemology is fascinating. It'll, we'll get into what he calls conversation, but if you give me an address, I can send you some of the stuff. I have no hesitation in saying this is one of the most brilliant sessions that we had in our series Gandhi Matters. And thank you very much, Sri Vishwanathan, for provoking us so much. Thank you. Uh, on 22nd of May, we have a Smriti Sabha for Suresh Sharma, our friend in IICNX. Those of you who might have known about him or known him are most welcome to join. On time, sir. 6.30. Everything in IIC starts at 6.30 in the evening. On 14th June, in the same Gandhi Matters, you will hear Neera Chandhok. So you're, if you remember the date, 14th June. Thank you very much. <laughs>